buddy. No, I think it's great. I just I don't think I've ever seen it that long. Yeah, it's a little crazy. What about you, man? You're you're not going the afro. Dude, you know me. I get a haircut twice a year. That's so what, that's COVID what didn't affect me at all. <laughs> <gasps> okay. <laughs> it's hot in LA, let me tell you. Is it? Yeah, man. It's like, we were getting some like storms crazy. coming in and it is cooling off. We're gonna have like highs in this high seventies next week. I can't wait. Oh man. No, we're in the nineties. Wow, that's crazy. Tissy, you're Tissy, you're muted. I hope you're okay still. Hi. Okay. How are you right. guys? So, are we assigned to any cases, or we just jump in when we feel like it? Just jump in. Just jump in. Um, I'm just downloading one last file from uh, from one of my from one of our other fellows, Ella, and then we should be good. Yeah, just jump in, Sahar. Um, if you have any questions, the cases are not going to be that long. It's, they're going to be right to the point, and then. You know, we'll do a poll, and while we're doing a poll, then just um, just uh, jump in. Okay. Uh, Tissy and Valentina, are you guys going to speak? Are you going to present on your own laptops? Yeah, I mean, do you, are you? I can I can present. I can show my slides. Okay, I'll let you do that because I don't I don't think I have your latest slide set. So you um, should upload update immediately because it's on Google Slides. Okay, I haven't uploaded it. Hey, Tissy, you might want to just uh, you know the you know the um. The aura slides, you may want to just take those out. Those probably are not that useful. I was going to recommend that, but otherwise it looks great. Okay, awesome, guys. We're, we're just uh, a couple of minutes and we'll get started. So thanks a lot for joining. We see some people already on board already. So do you want me to include the corner hysteresis? No, I, would, I wouldn't bother. Not even just right? Okay. I wouldn't bother. I mean, probably won't change much. So. Okay. Okay, great. I see we have uh, some folks joining. Let's see if we can get the chat going. See where everyone's coming from. Let's see. Oh, panelist. So, Arsham, are you are you like on web? Are you like are you webinars daily now, or are you uh, weekly? Uh, uh, I'd say probably like once a week only. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, there's like the random times. But no, it's man, I, it's it's good not traveling as much, man. <laughs> well, man, back in March it was like, oh, man, I, I had like webinars. Like, yeah, oh, God, no, no, it, no, it, was, awful. it was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. And you guys are organizing all the, the stuff you were doing is crazy. We, uh, yeah. a lot of our stuff's kind of like, you know, our in person conferences that we used to do, we're now doing by Zoom, which is great. We'll have like a lot more people attend it. Are you, but, are you doing, are you doing in person meetings too now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, because all the residents work together, it's, you know, there's no way I'm going to keep them separated and they're in the ER. So, uh, they'll they'll meet and they'll have like whoever's lecturing will just stand pretty far away when they give their talk but i just we just got an email where our schools are going to be all virtual now because the medical director of the the region doesn't want people to to get too close so so how what, what's the what's the next meeting you're going to be attending to in person in person yeah well i'm really hoping hawaiian i am speaking app but i god i hope that's not virtual <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, that, that was sting. <laughs> that was sting. Um, and then I'm hoping AGS. Honestly, the other ones have been virtual for um, IGC and and Academy. Yeah. So yeah, I know. It, it is what it is. Hey, Paul. Oh, what, what is happening, dudes? <laughs> <laughs> now we can start. Now we got Paul. Paul Singh here. Uh, <laughs> what's going awesome. on, guys? How are you, man? I'm good, man. Good. Miss y'all. Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's good to see you. I like your hair, man. It's getting curlier. It's getting good. longer. It's getting froier. Should I throw it out for this meeting? I could. <laughs> yeah, throw it out, man. Throw it out. All right. That. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to go pick it out. Okay. You asked for this. Oh, man, he's we'll get, we'll get. That's scary. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us, man. Good to see Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Always a pleasure. I love the fact you kept the body, the beard, and the hair, man. Good for you. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, I'm, I'm competing with you now. <laughs> Yours is longer than mine, man. <laughs> Good for you. It is. It. I, I don't. It's like, I don't like it though, man. It's. It's like. It's all <laughs> over. It's everywhere, man. Dude, you got some serious social media like backlash when you were saying you're gonna cut it. It was like, don't do it. <laughs> do it. Oh, I like that. Oh, nice. Hey, nice work. Crazy electrocuted oh. look. I love it, dude. Oh, that's perfect. You look like a crazy scientist now. Now you look like a true glaucoma specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, hey everybody! I, th I think I think we'll get started. We're uh, we've already got uh, our panelists here. We'll get we'll get going. 
Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. This is uh, kind of our restart of our PRISM rounds. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a Wednesday rounds. We're actually going to be switching up a little bit. We, um, we've had a lot of feedback from when to do these. It's always hard to know when to do, do these kind of rounds. But, um, but next, uh, next time we'll be doing it on a Saturday. Let me just pull this up here for a second here. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's, been, it's been four months since we've been starting these. And uh, we thought we'd restart them. They're always great to uh, get interactions and get people uh, talking. So this is what it's about. Uh, as you, as hopefully many of you know, we listed them up on our website as well as uh, have um, our previous rounds also updated as well. And uh, for those of you who uh, want to obtain credit, whether you're in Canada or the U.S., you can convert these to U.S. credits. Um, well, they'll be up to two uh, Section Two credits or two um, uh, MOC credits here in in Canada. So, if you, we will. Those of you who are attending, we will email you the uh, certificates. Uh, we are uh, doing our next rounds on Saturday, August 1st, which is actually coming up this Saturday. Uh, and we'll do it for a couple of uh, couple of Saturdays. We took a poll, you know, and um, as usual, of course, the, the vote was kind of split between Saturday morning uh, and, uh, and or a weekday evening. Um, and we appreciate all the support. A lot, a lot of people have written to us and asked us to continue. We got, we got, we got friends from Nigeria. Uh, it's just past midnight in, in Lagos, so thanks so much um, for joining us uh, from, from Nigeria and midnight there. Uh, Saturday morning might be a little easier for you, but of course it's also a weekend, so we'll see how, how, um, how everyone does with, uh, with that. Uh, let me make sure I can share my screen here. Actually, it's going to change this up again here. Sorry about that. Um, so today we have uh, basically uh, a format of cases. Uh, we've got um, we've got cases from our fellows that are going to present cases from me, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a great group of panelists, and I'll introduce them in a second. Um, we do want to get interactions, so we're going to do polling questions as well, and uh, the polling questions are great to get uh, people uh, talking a bit. So please be, be ready to uh, to do your polling. Okay, I hope this will show now. Let me know. I think this is showing now. Great. Okay, excellent. So next round is August first, eight o'clock in the morning, Toronto time. Uh, please be there. Okay, so this is basically glaucoma cases. What procedure should I do? And these are our presenters. These are our outgoing fellows. Uh, it's kind of sad. It's been a year, and uh, and they are now. They will be moving on. Of course, we can't let them leave yet because uh, there's no flights out to their home countries, uh, and so we're keeping them around for a little bit. We have Tiziana De Francesco, who's from Brazil, who is uh, just finished her, her first year. She's spending a couple more months with us. Who'll be presenting? We have Ala Mufti. Uh, who is uh, from Saudi Arabia, who uh, actually officially will be finishing uh, this weekend. Uh, but we'll, we stick around for, um, for a couple of months uh, as well uh, to uh, hang in and do some extra work. And then we have uh, Valentina Lozano. I'm not sure when that picture was taken, Valentina. It looks kind of the same. Um, <laughs> and uh, with the glasses look. Uh, from, uh, originally from Chile, who was, uh, did her training in Florida. And uh, and we'll be heading back to uh, to the U.S. So anybody in L.A., anyone in California needs a needs a great uh, glaucoma segment surgeon. Valentina is is ready to meet you. Uh, our panelists, we got uh, three well known folks here. Arsham Shabani, who actually was a former fellow. I don't remember Arsham. What was it like? Uh, five years ago? No, I don't remember now. Even man, too long uh, ago. Finished 2014. 2014. Look at that. Yeah. Six years ago. Crazy. Uh, and now he's uh, done amazing work, and he's uh, in St. Louis at Washington University. He's like, I think you're the director of everything, man. Residency, fellowship, you know. Don't remind me, man. Extracurricular, extracurricular. <laughs> yeah. Everything, man. And you can see how he's styling his hair there as well. Right. Uh, we have we have Sahar uh, Badrud, who uh, is always a favorite to be with us, who um, has done uh, training at uh, Wilmer as well. And she's had both an academic as well as uh, a prior practice. And uh, and uh, just came back from the OR. I think I, th I think both of you, both you and Paul, finished an OR day. So thanks for being here, Sahar. Always great to get your perspective. And in such a short time, you've really become a, a powerful force uh, in our community uh, and a great role model. So thanks for being here, Sahar. Thank you. Thanks for your support. And then there's our friend Paul Singh, uh, who um, we all know, of course, uh, with his entertaining style and his uh, DJing. 
Uh, we should. I, I need to get. I need to get your music on one of these webinars. By the way, Paul. So we need to do that one of these times. I'm ready, man. Anytime you want. <laughs> he has definitely put Racine on the map, right? I mean, I know where Racine is. Everyone knows where Racine is. Center, center, center of the, of the world for so much of innovation in glaucoma. So, um, and and all the work that he does, Paul. So thank you for being here as thank well. You. Appreciate that. Okay, these are our learning objectives. So we got to do this, of course. Um, and what we hope is maybe will help to, you know, uh, those attending to develop an approach to selecting the right procedure and the considerations. There's never a one choice, but it's really a matter of, of of thinking about, you know, the pros and cons of each of each option. We'll maybe uh, assist in using diagnostics and making that decision, and then compare some of the risk benefits of MIGs and subconj MIGs and traditional filtering surgery in terms of in terms of how we choose them. Uh, and so um, those are some of our learning objectives. Just some very, very brief, three, four slides about what we have available uh, to many of us around the world. We have our MIGS options, which uh, which we sort of really focus on the canal now, since supercoidal is not really available at this point. Canal devices and stents and, and trabeculotomies. We have BLEB procedures. Uh, we call some of these subconjunctival MIGS or subconjunctival uh, hybrid procedures, as, as I think um, Arshan likes to call them as well. And then we have our traditional filtering surgery, all creating blebs. And then we have cycloablation with micropulse being one of the more recent additions as well. And in terms of MIGs, we can divide them up between internal and external, as we as we saw here. And, you know, again, just to differentiate, MIGs is really that group of procedures that are ab internal angle procedures, while subconj are more, uh, and subconj makes are more external filtering procedures as well. Uh, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, it, is, it is definitely a bit of a confusing uh, time when you have all these options. I'll be interested. I, all our panelists we have here have used all these different mixed procedures. I'm interested to hear what they choose and why they choose and what differences there are and when they don't choose MIGS as well. And then we have our subconscious procedures, which are, of course, are more traditional-like in terms of their outflow pathway, uh, but delivered through a more controlled, less invasive, um, and more amenable bleb morphology approach. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, ophthalmology glaucoma uh, AGS position paper. This is a very busy slide. Uh, we can, you know, this is this is one way to divide them up in terms of microinvasive options and traditional approaches and microinvasive options are bleb forming or non bleb forming, inflow or outflow based, as you can see. Uh, and whether they're implants or whether they're cutting procedures or dilating procedures are ways to, to differentiate them. And then on the right, you see traditional surgeries, and we have uh, bleb forming versus more of a reservoir implant procedures. Uh, and uh, you can see again that there's some overlap in there as well. So this is this is probably a good way to look at it. And of course, the more you go over to the right, there's more risk dissection work involved, which is probably a good way to put it in. There's obviously more need to uh, to you know you know look at more data, look at more evidence. Uh, in terms of choosing these procedures, but this is a chance for us to talk about different cases and how we go about them. So Valentina is up to bat first. Valentina, I'll let, I'll let you start. And again, I'm going to uh, encourage our group of uh, attendees to ask questions on, on the chat group. Um, and uh, I will I will put some polling out as well. And then certainly our panelists, and we'll include, of course, Tissy as well. And uh, and we have Irfan. I should have, should have introduced Irfan, who's one of our new um, fellows, he's been involved. His beard's already getting longer already since he started. Good to see that. Uh, and uh, and we have uh, uh, Valentina, of course, will be a panelist. And we have Allah, who's seeing a Mac on retinal detachment right now, one of our fellows. So hopefully he'll join us later on. Okay, Valentina, take, take it away. Okay. And I would like to give some credit to Dr. Abner Belkin and Dr. Matthew Schlenker, who also took care of this patient. And we have a 37-year-old female. She's a professor with, who presents with us uh, to us with advanced uveitic glaucoma on the left eye. She has non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. Her Tmax has been 48 in the left eye. And she presents with six months of uncontrolled IOPs in the 30s and 40s on maximal tolerated medical therapy. That's four topical classes and Diamox 250 milligrams four times a day, and she's not tolerating her meds well. On examination, the right eye is normal, but we do note a afferent pupillary defect on the left eye. Her visual acuity is 2200, pinholes to 2080. Her pressure on our presentation is 44, does have some corneal edema, 
AC is deep and quiet. She has been off steroids for three months now, and she does have a three plus po uh, posterior subcapsular cataract, and she's very symptomatic for this. Also, the nerve is very cupped. Rena is flat, normal, and on gonioscopy, we do know that, notice that the angles are open without peripheral anterior synechia in both eyes. On visual fields on the right side, non-specific deficits, and then you can see on the left, she does have a very constricted visual field. OCT or NFL, we were not able to obtain um, image here, likely because of her big PSC cataract. So in summary, we do have a 37-year-old professor. She has advanced secondary open-angle glaucoma. Her IOPs have been 30s, 40s on maximal medical th tolerated therapy. She's not tolerating well. PSC cataract, again, with pinhole vision 2080, not seeing so well, and she's very motivated to have her cataract out. So our question here is, what will you do? Valentina, is she she still on steroids or has she been on steroids recently? Or is for this three been... months. Yeah, off steroids for three months. I have been for three months. And then when she was on them, she responded, she spiked pretty high too, or it's just been recently all of a sudden she ended up going up? With her um, I don't have a history for that, but it's been in the 30, 40s for the past six months. Okay. And then so she's out to 0.95 cupping. How long has she had the, the uveitis? for like at least five years and she has been, she doesn't want to get any treatment. She's been, she's only wanted to have um, drops, which is not tolerated so well, but she's been refused surgical intervention. So like a young 30 year old, no other, but they didn't identify a cause though. I know that's not your primary workup, but nothing that we know. No, and actually when we do with this surgery, we sent uh, some aqueous yeah. samples that were negative. And she has corneal edema currently, or she had historically, she had corneal edema. It's been, it's been like that forever, like maledema. Okay. Yeah. Cell counts, have you done, I'm just curious, have you done cell counts, have they decreased? Or it's just from pressure being high? Cell count on the AC, you mean? No, uh, endothelial cell counts. Do you think it's just all from oh, pressure? Oh, sorry, from I don't know. you think? Edema from pressure? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have the ACC. Okay, just curious. I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch, I'm gonna launch the poll and let you guys, let you guys talk through what you're gonna, what you recommend. And Valentina, do you know, uh, as far as her uveitis goes, she's off the steroids for three months, but that was the most, uh, like, how long has she been able to be off steroids before? Is, do we think this is going to be good? Is she on a biologic now? Or no. is she potentially going to be back on steroids? Right. So our plan is to, if we do surgery, put her on a steroid regimen. Pretty, uh -huh. Yeah. We'll talk but, about like our usual. But, but from her uveitis standpoint, though, did they have to put her on some type of immunosuppression? No, she hasn't been on any type of immunosuppression. It's a good question, Austin. I presume you're asking that because you're concerned she's going to need some long-term steroids yeah. and, and steroid response and what you choose based on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Although her visual field definitely starts to drive me in different directions than what I would initially do if she had a much better nerve. Yeah, I mean, her target pressure is definitely a lot lower, you know, like in the lower teens, young lady. So, I mean, I definitely would be more aggressive for her. Uh, with the cataract too, I probably want to take out the cataract, you know, soon as well. With corneal edema, we have a hard time. To, I would love to do. I always love angle migs if I can, but here's a patient where I'm not sure with the corneal edema. Uh, I'm not sure how much, and also the power of get angle based migs. If I'll be able to get her off the meds and get her down to the lower teens uh, as much as possible. That's my only concern with angle based migs at this time, uh, which is why I'm thinking more on the subcond route. Uh, but if she's been quiet for a while, if her conge doesn't look inflamed. Uh, you know, I'm not against doing a MMC Zen, believe it or not, I've done a few of those in this kind of situation. So I'm not opposed to that, actually. I'd give her a chance to, extra, I would do an external cut down, um, but I would do uh, that versus uh, if I can't avoid a tube shunt with her corneal edema and so young. Yeah. At the same time, you know, tube shunt with her activity would be the safer way to long term, I think, from from that perspective. So I'd be either a tube shunt with a uh, bar belt or a non-valve non tube or MMC Zen. So you know. just, just to clear, her edema is very mild. Like you actually get a really good view to the angle. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Does, does she, um, what's her axial length? Like, is she highly myopic, pretty emetropic? No, normal. Normal. You're asking that for a tube in cases? Yeah, well, because I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, like if uh, between my option, honestly, like I'd probably go more tube shunt route. I really don't like to put hardware when someone's that young, but she is, 
She's pretty advanced. GAT would be my procedure of choice if she had a better uh, optic nerve there. But like an Ahmed versus a bear vault, I'm looking for the pressure. And if I'm not worried about like chronic hypotony, this isn't something where the ciliary body is going to be shut down chronically. I'd rather a valveless uh, tube shunt. I'm going to try. What do you think? If I can, if I can get my way through these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, it's hard. I'll, I'll mute it. I'll mute it. <laughs> I'm just joking. Right. Oh man. Funny. <laughs> so, I'm going to chime in. I think immediately you think you want to do a FACO with a tube. Uh, this uveitic patient whose pressures are super high. You want to get that cataract out and anything else. The trap is then angle based and any kind of um, laser, well, the, uh, the laser may cause more inflammation and all the other ones may scar because she's just so highly inflamed. So for me, it's a FACO tube. <laughs> it's, and with really um, kind of proactive steroid do dosing, oral steroids before and after. So I usually do 40 mix per day, five days before and five days after. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> I mean, a GAT, a GAT is tempting. A GAT is very tempting in this case. Young lady, you can always go back and do a trab or a tube later on, and you haven't you, know, you haven't risked that at all um, because of her potential steroid response. Historically, it would be a good option for that. Uh, but then you might get some fema bleeding, and you might scar down quickly if she has inflammation later on. So that would be my that would be my concern for the for the GAT. Yeah. So so great great points. We had it a little bit easier because the patient actually she would refuse trabeculectomy. She would refuse tubes. You know and, and the only reason why she wanted to proceed with surgery was because her cataract was bothering her. So we actually ended up doing an angle-based procedure for her. And as you said, we did do um, so cataract surgery with a hemigat, so gonioscopy assisted translumina trabeculotomy. And um, someone mentioned, yes, so in, in her case, we did add 500 milligrams of IV methylprednisolone in the operating room. We did grab a sample of aqueous fluid and we sent it for some viral um, labs, which were negative. And then as Sahar said, we also do that. We do oral prednisone 40 milligrams and then we taper by 10 milligrams every week. And also we start them on topical steroids, which is prednisolone acetate 1% four times a day, a week prior to surgery. Was she, was she COVID positive or negative? This was before COVID. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm just messing with you. So we have, we have good data here. <laughs> yeah. This was done in 2018. You know, here's a kind of, okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Well, her, her other eye, uh, what was her visual acuity? Was she uh, uncorrected? 2020. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So you play no distance for this left eye. Okay, cool. Right, we, we, sorry, so we corrected for distance. We use a toric lens, yeah. Okay, so this is not her video, but this is what we, how we do GADS. This um, video was done by my co-fellow, Dr. Tiziana De Francesco. So we start with a 27 gauge needle uh, pointing out the TM, then we create a main temporal incision. We're going to inject some viscoelastic. We're using Provisc here. And then we make a round nose on the tip of the 5 proline, insert it with curved tires, put some OVD on top of the cornea, rotate the patient with an NVR blade. We proceed and create an incision in the trabecular meshwork. Dr. De Francesco, great video, by the way, I love it. And some pearls on the, the needle, um, maybe we should talk after your video, just how to yeah, get sure. the bulb rounded and everything too. Perfect, yes, and I do have another pearl here. As you see, there is some heme. So now Dr. De Francesco is pushing it towards the right side to keep a great view on the left side where we're going to thread the fibroproline. So now you grab micro forceps and that's how you start threading the fibroproline through the trabecular, sorry, the Schlem's canal. And people have different things here. I would say in order to get 180, it's 10 to 12 long pushes, but if you do small, then it should be 20. And then you keep threading and now you start pulling so you don't get any resistance and again you remove the lens and then start creating the trabeculotomy and if you will see here it will be right at 180 degrees very good and something very important here is just to keep the eye pressurized 
in order to prevent bleeding. In this case, it didn't ble bleed much, but you want to keep the eye pressurized, as I said, and uh, we've been putting, leaving some uh, viscoelastic in the anterior chamber after this procedure, just to keep the pressure up. So just one, just, just one comment, Valentina. So, so it's interesting because 13% of the respondents voted for, uh, for doing a GAT, uh, which, which, is, which is, of course, um, what you've chosen here. Majority went with the tube. Um, and so, you know, just keep that in mind, of course, in terms of uh, maybe what, what the procedure selection is. We'll, we'll have a chat maybe after results, uh, after results show, but it's interesting that you chose something that most people haven't, haven't, would not have chosen. Right. So usually when we do guide, we do see them on the same day. Um, their pressure was 14. There was minimal heme in the anterior chamber. Now we go from prednisone and acetate four times a day to every two hours. And then we do the prednisone 40 milligrams, again, taper by 10 milligrams every week. Mm -hmm. Then we see them on the next day. Her pressure is 10, 20, 80 vision. She does have a small a high femur with a temporal clot. And then we continue our post-op meds, which are usually Vigamox three times a day, Polenza daily, and prednisolone every two hours. Uh, we have more post-op course, but I'm going to make it a little bit shorter. At week one, her pressure is 12 on zero classes. But the difference here is that we actually end up seeing more inflammation. Uh, the gut is open, some heme in the angle. We continue the oral prednisone taper. We continue the prednisolone this time four times a day. And then we add Duracell three times a day. And again, this regimen, it's... You, we could have increased the prednisolone or we could have just switched to Duracell. Do you guys have Dextenza or DexaQ there available in Canada? Not, not yet. Yeah, not yet, right? Because I've found that's been really helpful in these situations where you haven't used a lot of steroids to decrease the demand topically. Yeah, that, that would be great. Uh, post on month one, her pressure is seven, zero classes. We do notice that she have a little bit of a PCO and a say, anterior chamber is much quieter, gut is open, and then we start tapering her steroids, all the topical, all the oral. At post of month two, her pressure is nine. Now she's daily Duracell, daily prednisolone. Post of month three, um, again, we do notice this PCO, even though she's 20, 25, we kind of want to do the YAG while she's on steroids, but she doesn't want any treatment. Her AC is quiet, and then we decide to keep her on prednisolone daily. At year one, we actually saw her like a little bit before that, and we wanted to stop all the steroids, but she ended up having trace cell at year one. Pressure again, it's seven, zero classes. We put her back on prednisolone drop to once a day. And this was very recently, I think two weeks ago, it's year two, her pressure was it's 10, zero classes, gut is open, AC is quiet on prednisolone daily, and we have stable visual fields and OCT without signs of regression. Well done. A really good case um, and also a good reminder to use MIGs and use the angle and as long as I think the key here is you guys were really aggressive on the steroid use and the patient was was actually using them so it made for a successful case and it was a great video so good job whoever did that. Yeah. <laughs> Curious uh, the panelists and then Mike you guys what are your thoughts on viscodilating with uh, with the GAT are you familiar you know, with the Omni or the eye track catheter these, these different devices out there? Have you used them? And you're curious, your thoughts in this case. Yes, I mean, no, no. <laughs> pressure was good, but. <laughs> I haven't had that many, so I, I can't give you a, a detailed answer. I think, Paul, I mean, I think it, 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 it makes some theoretical sense in terms of being able to kind of blow through any potential distal obstructions. We have seen some basic science and some histopath on collector channel ostea obstructions and adhesions and chronic glaucoma and high pressure. So, you know, it makes some sense. It may actually help prevent some hyphema perhaps as well. Um, so if you're there, why not? I guess is the, is the, is the point. I think there's probably no, not much downside on it. I think whether it actually makes a difference or not, we, of course, I don't really have any data to know that for sure. But I think, uh, you know, yourself and others are, are looking into this more. And I think, you know, whether we do it with stenting or with uh, otomy, um, is something of interest. We're going to be showing some more on this one later on these as well. But I think in the end of the day, I think the autonomy is what really, you know, makes a difference here. Yeah, absolutely. Good points. Absolutely. Hey, Arshmi. Here. 
I brought Mesh Lenker on too, who's with staff on this case as well. Uh, Matt, we want to join us. So th this, is, this is an interesting, unique case in the sense it's a young patient, U UVI, UVitic patient, uh, who doesn't have PAS and has has been controlled, relatively speaking, it sounds like. And so I think, you know, um, this particular patient population, you know, has been reported and many of us have had some success with angle procedures in general. It's pretty bold, I must say, Matt, to take somebody who's got that bad disease and, and, and expect that a canal procedure is going to lower them to target. I think just, I think a lot of people would, would question that. But I think as you probably may want to add to this, in, in those uveitic patients, sometimes you see some dramatic uh, responses to these angle procedures. And it's the uveitic young patient particularly uh, that does it. Um, if this patient didn't have uveitis and was a classic juvenile open and glaucoma patient, would you have chosen the same procedure, for example? Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you to Valentina for presenting that. It was great. And thank you for the invitation. Matt's uh, so nice, man. He's, he thanks people for <laughs> one minute first, right? And then he goes into this. Uh, so yeah, I, I honestly, so I, I see a fair amount of young uh, uveitics uh, just because of where my practice is. And I, uh, I cringe at the prospect of doing a tube shunt in these patients now. I think I've gotten to that point where I used to be kind of like this. And I, I'm now at the point where, especially if they're going to have phaco at the same time, um, which is not necessarily synergistic with filtering surgery, uh, I do think that this is a great approach. I think the issue is in deciding whether to do TM bypass is whether you believe they have a TM problem. And as I just alluded to, in the setting of more of a JOAG or a POAG, it's not as clear, though I would still err on that side with the caveat that this patient had advanced disease. Um, so in terms of the perfect patient profile, I would say this patient was perfect, um, except that she had the advanced disease. And I would also point out she was a little bit myopic as well, um, which is a, another reason why she could get hypotony in addition to her uh, uveitis. So I don't really think it, even though she was, she had already refused a trabeculectomy and a tube shunt from other surgeons, uh, which is why she was sent to me. Uh, I don't think it was a compromise to do this approach. And as the fellows who've been with me know, we're doing this right now a fair amount in these uh, young patients, uh, especially uveitics, but also, also JOAG uh, patients. The one part that I will not compromise on though, and we had a long discussion about this with this patient, again she had very strong opinions is i would not compromise on the steroids so she came to me she said i was told i need to have a filtering surgery i don't want it i said fine she said i'm not taking steroids post-operatively i said i will not do your surgery if uh, if that's going to be the case and i was very adamant about that and we did have a point where it was a little bit of a stasis there where her pressure was high and i i pretty much just said i'm not comfortable half doing it i told her i said some people think it's half doing it to just do the gat which I don't necessarily believe that, but I do think not treating the inflammation properly is a recipe for disaster. And the other point I would, I would make here is that th these patients often have a very aggressive eye pressures. So I would not hesitate leaving their pressure high postoperatively mm -hmm. for a day or two yep. uh, with vesicoelastic. And in fact, we've had a couple of cases now recently, which I'm not saying this is standard of care, but we've actually injected at post-op day one um, vesicoelastic to put their pressure even higher when they're starting to bleed a little bit because blood is very much a, a precursor or a cause for inflammation, which is already hard enough to deal with in these patients. So her, her pressure was 40 anyway. So why not keep it 40 for a few days as an investment to prevent uh, heme, uh, which will make for a smoother post-operative course. Great case. So let me ask uh, the panelists, I mean, if this patient had like PAS everywhere, would that have, cha would that have changed or would you, would you have steered away from an angle procedure, would you have still considered it here? Not necessarily. The only thing that had me going away from GAT, which is really in UV is my preferred treatment too, it was the med tolerability. And that was the big, big question in my mind. Um, so PAS, I do think the angle is probably going to be a little bit more collapsed if you have that. Uh, but we've had UV edicts that have had even granulomatous UV itis with PAS that we've treated with GAT. And then I've had some that, that didn't respond. Um, is, is there is there an age where you would think that you know you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do an angle procedure? I mean, these are young patients. What about a, an eighty year old, seven year old patient who has uveitis? Would you think about doing this in the same context of advanced glaucoma, or would you 
go to subconj. No, I'd go subconj if they're if they're that much older. And it looks like we start the the older they are around like around sixty years old or so. It's more difficult to get circumferential in the angle. So I imagine that probably relates to some issues within the canal anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, once they're older, if it's that high of a pressure and that advanced disease, I probably would go with the device under the con. And, and Sahar, you know, if this patient was a was a was a exquisite steroid responder, and and it sounds like this patient wasn't clear it was. It sounds like this patient wasn't a steroid responder. If but if they were, uh, would you still consider doing a, an angle procedure in that patient? I would start to worry at that point because you're looking at possible hyphemas, possible steroid response. If the patient was willing to take Diamox long-term or I could put her on it, I would. I mean, it, it sounds like the patient was really adamant about her care and you kind of has, have to customize it sometimes. It's just the way it is and, and it's okay. And, and so if she was really adamant, I would say, okay, then you need to probably be on prolonged Diamox with a potential risk of needing a tube during this time if, if I can't control your pressure. Um, but yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not unheard of, but I would probably still t uh, steer her towards a tube, but it's not again, it sounds like she didn't want it. So, and, and it worked out for her. So, um, but yeah, I think I would, I would really do some good consulting <laughs> during that, that pre-op. I mean, the, yeah. the, beautiful, the, the beautiful thing about angle-based MIGs, for the most part, is that you know you always have the option. You, know, you need to put a tube later on if you have to. I mean, if you try the angle-based MIGs and the pressure's still 40 on meds. You're like, all right, well, we tried it. You know, let's go ahead and do a tube. So you, you're not limiting your options at all, which I think is such an important part of, of these conventional alpha MIGs. Just a last question. Uh, Maria Fernanda from Colombia. Thank you, Maria, for being here. Uh, if you didn't do the cataract surgery, you weren't going to do cataract surgery, or maybe didn't have a cataract, or the pseudophagic, and that same patient here with pressures in the thirds and uveitic, would you still have done a GAT? Yeah. And answer is, what do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, okay. well, results like that, sure, of course. <laughs> I would have done a GAT. Matt, what do you think? Would you do it, would you do it uh, on a standalone? I think the fellows knew, no, I, I, we did one last week, the week before that, three weeks before that. <laughs> 24 year old, 21 year old. I think that I, I said, I, I've seen enough problems with tubes later on. I've, dealt, I've done buccal mucosal grafts on tube, exposed tubes in young patients. We've seen hypotony. We've seen corneal complications. I think like Paul said, it's, uh, it's worth a try. You know, to your comment on, on uh, PAS, glaucoma is sometimes about a lesser of two evils. I would still try to do GSL or even go through uh, PAS sometimes with a GAT uh, to avoid doing a tube shunt. And I treat post PAS or post GAT PAS kind of like with ALT. I do think it's reasonably inevitable for some patients, but getting a little bit of PAS uh, postoperatively with a reasonable IOP control, I still think is better than having a tube shunt at a young age. Okay, great discussion. Hey, one last um, comment. Sorry, Mike. One yes, last comment. Paul, please, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Reverse is also true, though. I've had patients where you've had a history of tube surgery, and I've done a GAT instead of doing another tube. So you don't don't forget the angle. If your angle is still open in there and you can see enough of the TM, you know, don't forget a GAT can be done after tube surgery has been done historically. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Great stuff. So so this is uh, uh, that was an that was a good case. Thank you, Valentina, for presenting that. Um, this is a patient who is presenting with glaucoma in their better eye, 74-year-old uh, white male who's pseudophagic with a long history of primary open angle glaucoma. Presenting pressures were 31 on four classes of medications in the right eye. In the left eye, the pressure was 17 on zero medications, thick cornea. This patient's had SLT numerous times in the past and has had a mitomycin trabeculectomy in the left eye in the past. The left eye is lost fixation. That was even before the trabeculectomy was done and has been 2,400 and been relatively stable. The right eye is 2025. 20, and remember the patient's pseudophagic, open angles with two plus pigmentation. You can sort of focus on the, on, on the right eye. You can see the asymmetry in the RNFL and the cupping and the macular uh, loss. 74-year-old, uh, you know, somewhat, somewhat, somewhat substantial, although the inferior RNFL, as you can see, still uh, has, has a fairly reasonable uh, inferior hump. The visual field, left eye, you can see how bad it is. The right eye, you can see that, you know, 
you know, emerging nasal steps and the superior and inferior aspects of the horizontal meridian uh, with some peripheral, possibly arcuates present as well. And you can see the, the, uh, the optic nerve head present with some, uh, some slight, not, uh, slight notching and slight sloping. Okay, so here's the, qu that's the question here. Remember, this is a 74-year-old male who has a pressure of 31 on four meds with what we would classify here uh, as, uh, as more of the mild, maybe the moderate glaucoma in his better eye with the previous terectomy in his, in his, in his uh, bad eye. Uh, terectomy didn't cause the vision loss, but he already had poor vision in, in that, in that, um, at that time point. Okay, so this is a time where well, we'll get the panelists ask any questions you want. Uh, or maybe think about what you would choose here. Um, let me uh, launch the poll. A lot of options here. We got MIGS, stenting, or admin or trabeculotomy. We've got uh, subconjunctival MIGS. We've got deep thorectomy, trabeculectomy, tube shunts, micropulse. So, panelists, I'll open up to you. What are you going to think about for this 74 uh, year old gentleman? Well, did he have any response to his previous SLTs? He had a response, like you know, six seven years ago, and then had a second one. It was kind of eh, not so great. How was the course with the first trab? Rocky. It was okay. It was okay. I mean, he's got an avascular bleb. I'll tell you that. But otherwise, he's you know didn't have any major, like you know, complications. I think my choice for him would probably be a subconch mix of some sort. If that doesn't lower it for some reason or it gets scars up, then. Um, I'm, I'm, I still like a good trab. I know you don't want to hear that, Ike. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to hear that. I'm with you. Like if, if the first route went well and the vision loss wasn't from the surgery and they, the patient felt like the surgery was pretty reasonable to go through. I mean, it's not like we can guarantee it's going to be the same, especially with a trab, but I don't think trab's unreasonable. You know, they get around 17, 16 off drops. Yeah. Uh, that might be work out pretty good. I know we got better things that have a little bit better control, but it, for me, it's always kind of like, if I'm going to shift them to another surgery on the other eye, when the first surgery went well, at least, you really have to have a good reason. And so I think it's very reasonable to go with the trap. I'd still like to favor toward like a, a Zen or a Prezer flow, but. I, yeah, I do a yeah. Zen. I do a, I do a Zen on this one. So you, you, got, you guys just heard of a uh, 30 some IOP with so many meds with the pressure of 10 at one year after a GAT, and all of you are going subconch. What happened here? What happened? What switched here? Right now, it's the result on the other side. So if, so the patient hadn't had previous surgery, you would change your mind? Yeah, that really does. I mean, because if they've had a really poor result with something, it changes my mind. If they've had a good result with something on the other side, it changes my mind. Even, uh, with, the, even, with, the, even with the visual field being what it is right now, look at that visual field. But look at the other visual field. And there's yeah, also the age. Very right? symmetrical. But yeah. So so what if it's 74 went... years old, right? Yeah. So you know it could go that route. I think I don't think you can argue against a trabeculectomy with a pressure of 31 with a good trap functioning on the other side without a complication. We just heard about the fact that you can go angle and then you can always go to a trap later on, right? Sure. I mean if an angle right. may work. But you know, if you talk to them and they're okay with the tra trap the first route, I don't think it's unreasonable. I really don't. Now, would I prefer angle or subconj? Yes. If you had zero surgery, no prior history on that left eye, uh, yeah, I'd probably with this level of disease, I would probably go his, even- His bleb, like I said, looks, is, I'm serious, it's really avastor. It's like thin, man. It's like, <laughs> Well, if you push me that route, yeah. sure. <laughs> then actually I might not even want, I might not even want like a device bleb necessarily then. You know, it's, uh, but do they tolerate their medicines pretty well? So if we got them down to like around a 20 with an angle procedure, we can medicate them down with two drops. He's taking four meds. He's, he's okay. Yeah. Eyes a bit red. And I'm not opposed to micropulse for this patient. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, what was his vision again? 2025. Yeah. I mean, I think as a, if, if you can set it up as like a, a first stage, you know, add, let him know. I mean, this is the most non-invasive of all your choices. Um, you can consider it. I don't do them very often, but I will. I will do it if someone's opposed to invade, like uh, invasive or any kind of surgery at all. Uh, I would still go subconj, but it's I would offer the, the micropulse. It's interesting, non-invasive, because I mean, invasive to me isn't just making an incision. Invasive is how much do you like, you know, change the normal anatomy and physiology of the eye, right? And so, I mean, you you could basically like do cryotherapy, and that's non-invasive, but literally, it's like freezing the eyeball, right? And that's terrible. So 
I don't know if I totally use, I don't know. That's why I'm always worried about invasiveness, meaning incision size. A bare valve implant is a 20, you know, you know, three gauge needle track. And that's like the only entry in the eye. And so that could be considered to be non-invasive in that sense. So I guess it's a big thing. I, I don't know. I've just, I just haven't been comfortable with micropulse. I don't know what, maybe it's just me. And I was one of the earliest ones to do them. I just haven't found to be consistent, especially a, a guy hasn't previous hasn't had previous surgery. I just haven't found a place for. It. I don't know. I mean, I, I I hear colleagues around the world though who have used it and, and are liking it. So uh, obviously, there's a lot more I think to it than than I see it. But I just I, I, to mention that. I mean, I, for me, in my hands, if it's my clinic, I, I think the question about tolerating drops is huge because if my goal, and I think with any MIGS procedure, any kind of surgical procedure, you have to look two goals. What is your target IOP and what is your risk or what is your desire to get rid of drops? If someone is like, I can't tolerate drops at all, then I'm going to hedge my bets and go for a subconj like a Zen. In this case, we just had a little, little bit of quicker recovery because he has good vision. But if he's okay taking drops, like Arsham said, if he's going to be okay taking drops, then yeah, I think an angle-based surgery is fine because he's, he's okay to take drops. So for me, that's a big rationale to decide which one I would do. See, if we worry about the bleb morphology, I don't know if then, like if you're really concerned, I'm not going to do a trap because I don't like this really ischemic bleb. Well, either you're going to vary your mitomycin and any subconj I think is okay, or you're going to stay away from subconj then. And so then I think angle is reasonable. It's just a 74-year-old, four classes and a pressure over 30 with GAT. Even though we do a lot of GAT, I don't have a ton of confidence that that's going to do great. So is is the difference here the age? For me, absolutely. Absolutely. And and also maybe the underlying ideology? Yeah, yeah. But even, yeah, I would say that. But it's really the age because that's also part of why the ideology is what it is. You know, Um, Mm -hmm. it'd be different if they were younger. It'd be probably Joag. So... Yeah, I mean, the, if the ischemic bleb is what's scaring me from doing a trab, then I'd be cautious then even with uh, Zen or Preser flow. And either you're going to vary your mitomycin, uh, but I think we've all seen various ischemic blebs no matter what we do. And a lot of it depends on the mitomycin, their tissue reaction, how well they metabolize it. All right. Well, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything more. This is uh, certainly a, a, good, a really good discussion coming up for our first case. We had... About 40% that was going subconscious MIG, Zen or Preser flow. We had uh, next was basically an ab internal trabeculotomy or a GAT. And then we had some stenting. We had it, we had very few on the trabs and tube shunt side. So so here's what we did end up doing. We did end up doing um, uh, basically an ab internal viscocannulostomy and, and trabeculotomy. This is the Omni procedure uh, using um, the cannula to uh, first start the uh, insertion of the uh, filament which is used to actually viscodilate. Paul mentioned this earlier, dilating the canal and perhaps beyond that. And then also using the same uh, filament to go on the other side uh, and basically also do the same thing. And then also one can perform a GAT, 180 degree uh, so-called GAT or trabeculotomy procedure as well. And so that went pretty uneventfully, you know, pretty fine. Um, postoperatively though, basically as you see here, Pressure dropped for the first, you know, week or so, but then basically went back up, and you can see even off the steroids, which we always think about steroid response. Did you try pilo? Rises. Did you try pilo at all? Uh, he was not on pilo early on. No, it's it's no. bizarre. Sometimes after these like hemi gats or gats, like you'll put them on like three classes, and you might get maybe a twenty percent total reduction, and you'll just start pilo alone, and massive pressure drops. I don't know if you guys have seen that or used it. It's not well tolerated, but Oh, no, and it's true even without surgery, right? Yeah, Someone who's yeah. never had a meiotic and you put yeah. them on it, um, yeah. it, can yeah. be, it can be quite quite rheumatic. As a, sing- absolutely as a right. single agent, like, it's actually, like, I really like it as a go-to if I start seeing PAS forming and the pressure spiking and we're off the steroids. I think it's a reasonable drop to start just to see if you can salvage it. Yeah, I, I personally don't always use uh, power routinely in these procedures, yeah. but if they're developing PAS, yes. I find the tolerability sometimes is, is not great. That's true. But I do like I do like the I do like the PAS uh, prevention strategy, um, and maybe maybe it is a beneficial thing to keep uh, you know the uh, uh, you know the leaflets open perhaps. Yeah. I, don't I mean, because part of part of the problem sometimes it's not like if you do the trabeculotomy, you'll still usually have a flap of TM, and then if it flaps back and now shuts across the collectors and closes them off, you're sometimes in a worse situation than where you started. Absolutely. That's why, like the, the age and the pressure to me just made me really 
uh, nervous. But yeah, like a 30 year old coming in with that visual field defect, pressure could be 60. And I think that is very reasonable. Yeah, so maybe maybe for the group again, and, and either yourself or others. So, what is it about the age that makes you makes you differentiate doing one or the other? Yeah, so some of that's our own internal data. The other side is just looking at some of Devinder's original work. Certainly, the severity as it increases, the procedure is not as efficacious. I'm not talking about success criteria. I'm talking about true deltas or pressure reduction. So, forget about your goals. Just how much of a pressure reduction will you have? And then the second thing is, you know, I'm assuming this. But that's severity. Though. That's severity, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is not as severe, but they've probably been on medicines for a while. And I don't know if now you're getting the distal collector a atrophy yeah. and, and no matter what you do to the TM side, it's not going to change. And like what Matt said, it's where is the disease? Is it TM or we're now thinking now distal? That's exactly my point. I think that's huge. I think the fact that that's what I ask about SLT. I think the more advanced you are, the longer you've been on medications, pressure 40 on four meds, you, the, res, the resistance is not just TM. The, the pathology is beyond the TM, the distal channels, in my opinion, in a lot of these patients, this type of scenario, which is why you can open up the TM and open it up and even viscodilate, but it's going to collapse again, which is what happened in this patient. So, so as you can see here, basically four months out, he's still up. And actually, you can even see on the visual field, unfortunately, he's had some some progression, even though we've only got a couple of visual fields here. Um, compared to what he had preoperatively, you can see there's, there's certainly more superior changes, uh, which would want to be repeated to be sure of it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is this is an example where where an admin internal trabeculotomy doesn't always work. Um, and and certainly there there is variability. And I think what you're hearing is that you know, we need, to, of course, more data to support that. You know, in fact, some of the original papers, however, from the Japanese and from Davinder Grover and others, those these average patients were not young patients in their studies. Oh. Uh, these were older patients, right? You know, as well. So, you know, yeah, I think yeah, that, that's what I mean. Some of it's more the experience. Once you do it, you start to see, like, as a standalone procedure, the older patients are. It's generally not as effective. And then, I mean, that's also the population that ends up on blood thinners and can you stop them or not. We had a guy that ended up with a deep venous thrombosis after we stopped his blood thinner because we were going to do an ankle procedure. So uh, I think you just start to consider things a little differently when they get older. Yeah, I, I think the blood thinner thing is a good point. I think most of us are are a little bit, you know, reluctant, uh, even in a young patient, mind you, to do um, a cutting procedure like that. Uh, and so, you know, I think I think there's still, I think the, the story is still unfolding. I think in terms of where, what role do we have for? I mean, any mixed procedures. One thing that's unique here: this was, wasn't combined with cataract surgery. And yeah. So I think that is one of the variables too. If you're already in there doing cataract surgery, yeah. we get some lowering from that. Maybe do something synergistically. But here's an example where, we're, where it's a standalone, and so the argument to go in just specifically for glaucoma is a little different. That being said, uh, I think the experiences that we've had have been somewhat variable. Uh, you know, we've had young patients with pigment dispersion, uh, you know, 40-year-olds, 45-year-olds that have done, you know, reasonably well on GAT, and others that have just done terrible, you know. And we've had older patients that have done, you know, quite well with GAT and others that haven't. And we have younger patients who have. So I do, I do say, and just, that's, not, that's not too different than trabeculectomy and other procedures, a lot of variability. Mm -hmm. The key is, though, that um, we're going from a less invasive procedure to a more basic procedure. And so, uh, as we've heard, although in this case we've had a patient who has lost some field, if it's something that we can, you know, do as a first option, as a first safer option, uh, it's, it's something that to be considered. But this, I want to, to just share an example. I don't want to only just show cases that go perfectly well. Um, and maybe I won't take a poll here, but I think all of us would probably agree that now that this patient has, has failed a, an angle procedure, the next step would be to do something subconj. And as you heard, uh, trabeculectomy is an option, subconj mix is an option. Um, you know, I'm, cur I'm curious that I guess the, the first eye result made you think of doing a trabeculectomy for some of you. Although I will say that trabeculectomies are so variable that one eye result doesn't always parlay into a, a second eye result, especially when the vision is, is so much better in that second eye and the refractive differences and other issues around a bleb that you create from a trap may occur. So I, again, I hope that was, I hope those were good, uh, good discussion points. I don't know if there's anything else, maybe Sahar, you want to add to this one? Any other comments about, uh, about procedure, procedure selection? Obviously hindsight's 2020, but um, any other thoughts on this case? You know, I don't really look at the age too much as a consideration. Uh, so I probably would, you know, well, maybe now I will after hearing Arsham, but I would still consider the angle, always consider it. And, and again, I think we, I think we, I think uh, Sahar paused there for a second. I think to basically create an outflow track. 
Um, and I think that that that's perfectly reasonable. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's much else I need to add. I think you guys covered it. Great. So as, as always in glaucoma, there's always some controversy and questions and debates and uncertainty. So <laughs> Uh, so there, there you go. And I, and I, after everything I've been doing, I, I am certainly not clear on uh, on what the right answer is always. But I do say that, you know, with someone who has mild disease, man, I, I am, I am, no matter what age they are, I am not keen on giving them a bleb. I am not. Keen. No, I, I agree. I would have probably like a year and a half ago treated the this patient the exact same way, uh, but just looking at her own internal data, it's it's steered me the other way on these. And yeah, and I tell patients even if it's a success rate thirty percent. Even yeah. 10%. That seems pretty crappy, right? Yeah, but it's one in three patients we've avoided a bleb on, right? Yeah. At the same time, you know, we're not showing all these and, and we've all had cases we've done gas on and we got a high FEMA, we got a pressure spike. Um and, and so gas not always benign either. And and even though we think that you know GAT doesn't have a bleb, you can get some major pressure spikes and that can itself potentially put people over I mean, the you, edge you as well. So a cyclodialysis cleft, we've had that referred and um so yeah, you're right. It, it yeah, can be very invasive. There's a couple of questions. Question, what do you guys think about doing ECP at the same time? There's a question that came in here about uh, inflow. Yeah. When would you combine an ECP type procedure with an outflow procedure? Yeah, good question. What do you guys think? I mean, I think you, you might be risking tysis and hypotony and this is a monocular patient. So I wouldn't want to burn both ends of that candle. I would try one. And if it still remains high, then you can try another. But um, I, I would be a little bit worried, uh, basically reducing both out, um, inflow and outflow in this patient. There's got to be a happy medium. Um, just you know, there's one note I wanted to kind of make. Like if, if you have a patient who's had a trab and their pressure is great and they're off drops, you also have to see like this patient's really advanced glaucoma. It's almost like a burnt out POAG. So, you know, yes, that person may have had an avascular bleb and, and it may be functioning well, but may, they may not. They just might be at the, the end of the road for that eye. Um, and basically, I've seen a lot of patients who will be at like a pressure of eight or nine in this like kind of burnt out stage uh, where the eye is just not making a lot of fluid. Uh, so you have to kind of be aware of that. You may not want to judge the first eye from the other eye because that eye is not seeing very well. And it's super advanced glaucoma. And it got there for a reason. <laughs> so maybe it won't work. That's a good it. point, Sahar, is that they got to that point even before surgery. So you know what direction it could take. Um, but you're right, Ike. I mean, there's 74. You'd rather not do a, a blood based procedure if you can avoid it. Yeah, tough calls. I mean, in this case, well, in this case, this patient is getting a bleb, right? But uh, now, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's a, it's about percentages and odds, right? And I think oh, sure. we don't want to be anecdotal about it. But these 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 are good, these are absolutely good discussions to have, and I hope. We've given the attendees a bit of a bit of something to think about. Okay, so uh, and the one question by Dave about Kahook versus Gat. Uh, you know, anyone want to comment on that? There's a question. What about Kahook in place of Gat? What do you think? I mean, you're talking like in that case, we already know that a larger like goniotomy or trabeculotomy didn't work. So I'd be cautious going smaller. I don't I don't know if that would give you any advantage there. And just in general, maybe the I think Dave's question is more general. Like if you're thinking about Gat in your head. What about just doing a hook dual blade? I think you can, like, if you're doing a GAT as a standalone, it, like, that's reasonable. If you're going with FACO and you're on the verge of GAT versus uh, a partial goniotomy, I think partial goniotomy is reasonable if you have cataract surgery combined with it. I think the issue is still the same. Where is the resistance to outflow? And mm -hmm. this patient, I think, would have made a difference because it was the distal channels that are probably atrophied that caused the issue. So, Paul, I want, I want you to just make one comment. I know you have an interest in this. You actually make a very valid point. I mean, and that's actually, that's this is exactly what has happened here, right? This patient, if you go into them, they've got like an opening. They got a nice opening. You can see back to the scleral spur, right? So clearly, this patient has some distal outflow issues. What do you think? What do you think about preoperatively using any means that you want to talk about here to help guide you on that question? Do you have any any ideas on that? Maybe you can share your thoughts. Well, I mean, you know, you, I, SLT has been a big thing. You know, I asked about SLT earlier because if someone failed SLT or, or let's say had a minimal response, it, it just tells me that there's probably some resistance beyond the TM. I mean, because really the primary area where its efficacy is at the TM level. So I use that. If someone had a failed SLT, I kind of already think about it's probably something distal to that as well. The fact that also is on four meds and pressure 40 tells you that there's probably some atrophy going on and using the other eye 
that ended up getting a trab. I think this is telling you that a, the distal channels are probably atrophied. You can look at the, we're looking at now using something called the Plex Elite, which is another OCT, Swepsis OCT, looking at imaging the limbal vessels now, trying to correlate between outflow resistance and MIGs and the actual architecture of the vessel. So we're gonna learn more about that, but that's the next frontier, I think, of really targeting our MIGs procedures to understand where the resistance to outflow is. So how did, you know, we heard about pilo. What about using pilo before? If you, if you put someone on pilo and they do great, would that tell you maybe that, you know what, maybe the issue is TM and you can get away with doing a TM procedure. If they didn't respond to pilo, then maybe not. Would they, what do you think about that? Some people talked about that. I think that's interesting. And I, I think it's, I think it's worth a shot. If they respond to pilo, that's telling you some information. I would obviously have to, I would probably take them off all of them to see if really the pilo is the one that's the, the kicker. Um, but if that's changing the anatomy such that the outflow is improving in that way, then yeah, it does give us information. And there is information that if they respond to SLT previously, then they may respond to angle surgery. So you have to, you know, I always say this, every single patient is so different. So you have to kind of tweak it around and say, okay, does it work for this patient? Will they respond? Will they tolerate pilo? All of these things. So, um, so I think it's not unheard of. And I think it's an interesting thing to test uh, you know, if you, if you want to go forward with angle surgery for these patients. Yeah. A lot of opportunity to, uh, to learn and help guide us, uh, which we look forward to more in the future as well. Okay. Well, Tissy, Tissy has a case to present. Uh, this, this is great. I love the discussions here. Uh, we could go one hour for each case. We'll, we'll hear at least Tissy's case. And I think I see Allah on board, so we'll get to these two cases and I think we'll, we'll have a lot to discuss. So Tissy, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So my case is a 63 years old female that was referred to as with high IOP in both eyes. And this patient had a, a primary angle closure glaucoma advanced in the right eye and moderate in the left eye. And she was diagnosed one year ago. Her vision is 20-20 in both eyes and her pressure is 35 and 33 on four classes. But this patient is tolerating the medication well. And her CCT is 537, 522. No previous ocular surgery no previous laser surgery, and no family history of glaucoma. So the anterior segment exam, it was overall unremarkable. This patient had a mild cataract and her angles were closed. Uh, we could see Schwab's lines in three quadrant and TM and one, and pigmentation was uh, one plus. And the uh, optic nerve, this patient had uh, big cups and uh, with uh, thin rims in both eyes, especially uh, inferior. And as you can see here in this anterior segment of CT, this patient had closed angles. And here we have the UBM. And uh, in the UBM, this patient has a, a, like a minimal lens rise and there's no uh, significant plateau but there's also confirming that the angles are closed. And here we have the OCT. So this patient had a, um, an RNFL defect inferiorly in both eyes, inferiorly and superior, especially on the right eye. And also this patient has a GCC defect, diffuse on the right eye and inferior in the left eye. And on the visual field, you can see that it, it actually correlates with the optic nerve. This patient has a, an arc rate uh, superior defect in both eyes. So here is uh, our case. We have a 63 years old female with PACG, advanced right eye, moderate left eye, vision is 2020 with mild cataract, pressures are high on four classes and uh, on average CCT. So what would you do next? So let's put the polling questions up maybe. Tissy, do you have another slide with the question with the uh, options here? I, I can pull, I can do the poll here. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So. I know that uh, I know that um, Arshim had to hop off on, on another uh, another meeting. So, Sahar. Nice, I get to talk. All right. <laughs> perfect timing. Perfect. Yes, perfect timing. Thanks, Arshim. Uh, I think for, for this patient, I would do FACO for sure. I would do FACO ECP. The ECP both for the pressure and to basically change the anatomy and open up that angle by kind of tilting down the ciliary body. And I would consider goniosinephilisis, take some retina forceps and just pull down and open up the angle. Um, so that's what I would do. That's not on your list, but so that's probably not what you did, but, <laughs> but that's what I would do. I, I, actually, to be honest with you, 
that's, to be honest with you, Tissy will tell you that's that's actually what we did do. We didn't want to complicate things, so we didn't put the ECP in there. But Tissy, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so she, she she didn't have a PAS, yeah. So uh, yeah, but was kind of what we did. Anyone wants to comment? Uh, what we I know did. Paul has to take off too, man. So Paul, any any comments for you about this? Your approach to angle closure in these cases, clear lens, twenty twenty, uh, high pressures. Would you would you would you do a would you think they need a subconscious filter? You see there was about 17% voted for that. There were some FACOs in there. I think you're, I think, let me unmute you. Yeah, there. sorry. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely, I think, I still think even with a mild, with a mild cataract, it's still good to take them out. The good, look at the data, shows you less need for incisional surgery down the road, better IOPs long-term. So I would take out the lens and try to do a FACO, I try to do a FACO with a trabecular bypass type of surgery in this case. Great. Well, it looks like the majority kind of voted that that line as well. FACO being the, the being the platform for angle closure management. So, Tissy, you want to want to continue yeah. along here? So it was kind of what we did. So we decided we were we actually we discussed uh, about uh, FACO and MIGS. And I actually at that time I was starting my fellowship and I was wondering I, why can we not like uh, combine FACO and filtering surgery as this patient has an advanced glaucoma with high pressure. I was kind of uh, uh, wondering why couldn't we do, but uh, in this case, because the patient was tolerating the medication well, we wanted to avoid as much as complication as possible. We went for FACO IOL eye stand, and here I'm just gonna show a quick video of an eye stand implantation. And uh, so here we 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 implanted G1 eye stand, uh, left eye stand here in the Schlenz canal, and uh, this is uh, the our boss <laughs> doing surgery here perfectly. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's your video. <laughs> it looks like you. <laughs> yeah, kind of. And here we have the right uh, stand and we have some blood reflux as expected. So, and what I want you to show here, and uh, I just jumped for the, for the late post-op. We saw this patient recently. She was uh, nine months after surgery on the right eye and uh, seven months after the surgery on the left eyes. We did the same surgery for both eyes. And her vision was pretty good, was 2020. And her pressure on the right eye was not ideal, but was um, reasonable, much better than before on two classes. And on the left eye, uh, we were considering that was, uh, we could uh, tolerate this pressure for moderate disease. And uh, we were actually pretty happy with the result. We avoided to do a filtering uh, procedure. And we had a pressure that is uh, on the right eye is not ideal, but we still have one more, well, two more glaucoma med medications to restart. And we we're actually pretty happy that we, we avoided this, a surgery that could cause more complication. And here, just to show the UBM with the lens uh, in the bag and with the angles open now. And we repeated the, the OCTs and the visual field and the tests were pretty stable. And it's like a, it's nearly one year after surgery and uh, the tests are, so that's, that's interesting because then putting an ice scent in this case would be off label, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would not have, I mean, it's, there's always a, not always, but sometimes there's enough view for you to do angle surgery or to do a bypass like that. But yeah, for us, that would have been, I would have been off label I'm like, ah, can't do it. Got to do something else. But, um, Here's the point. So. sorry, Paul, go ahead. No, I was saying, and this is a case where I probably would have combined the viscodilation too. And this is kind of, one of those cases when I've been doing a lot of combo cases. The thought is when you have chronic angle closure, you're decreasing flow and you do get some collapse of the Schlem's canal. And so trying to dilate the Schlem's canal as well as put the stents in, I think would be a nice potential. And again, I can't tell you, you know, would it make a difference, but I can tell you our data set, the absolute magnitude of reduction is about the same as the stent alone uh, or, the, or the viscodilation alone. But the magnitude of reduction of medication burden in our in our practice has been shown to be significant. So we're able to get less medications postoperatively needed to get the same IOP around middle teens. Something to think about. Yeah, yeah. No, I, and again, there's a little downside, although there is some, I guess, cost considerations in some situations. But I think you're right. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I think the the take home point here is that I think a trabecectomy or a filter, for any matter, in angle closure isn't necessarily the first step. Even in somebody who has maybe more advanced glaucoma, and I rarely if I have a bona fide angle closure, I will rarely go right to a trab. And it's it's really uh, lens-based, opening the angle with going to seek lights if you need to. Uh, Sahara, I like endocycloplasty, as you mentioned, with there's a high plateau. Um, and uh, the question is whether fake alone would have been enough. I mean, the studies out there, whether it's Eagle study or the Hong Kong studies from Dennis Lam and Clement Tam as well, 
they're all FACO versus FACO Trav, right? Or FACO versus LPI. So one could have argued maybe FACO alone may be enough, and that may be enough. Um, we do we do add stents because, as Paul mentioned, uh, and we know from chronic appositional closure that the TM may be dysfunctional, even appositionally closing the you know for for a period of time, and certainly with Sinechia. So this is an area that probably deserves further exploration. But certainly, I think FACO alone, just like avoiding a TRAB in that young patient. Uh, particularly uveitic, I think it's another group that I think we can avoid doing a bleb on as a first line at least. Now that right eye is coming up to 20 on two meds. They may be looking towards something in the future, but uh, I think we all agree doing a trabeculectomy or a filter, not combining with FACO is a, is a better bleb to manage postoperatively. So, Sar, any, 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 thought, any further thoughts on angle closure, severity of disease? Would you do a filter in, in some of these cases first, first line? Uh, no, I would almost always do. So I was trained at Wilmer, so they would have done the cataract and the trap for sure at the same time. Uh, I think as you go into real practice, that's not always the best thing to do because it creates a lot of inflammation potentially, it may scar your trap. Um, so I would do it stepwise. I, I would try the cataract with ECP. If that doesn't work, I would, I would consider going to a trap, um, or any kind of subconch, uh, MIGS device. Absolutely for this patient. Pressure is high enough where we could um, afford to do almost anything and it should come down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think stepwise is always a nice way if you can get away with it. Uh, it's just the really advanced patients, of course, sometimes we know the luxury of that. But angle closure, we see some pretty pretty big drops. So fantastic. Paul, I know you I thought you, I know you probably have to top off. So when you have to go, man, no problem. So how are you now you now the floor is all yours. <laughs> These boys are no longer going to be. Thanks, put, everybody. Uh, Great job, thanks man. So much, Paul. Be safe. Bye, Paul. Uh, yeah. So, Allah, thank you. I think it looks like you're in the, in the emergency department. Uh, yeah, seeing patients. I'm so, thank you for joining us. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm really glad that I was able to join you. Yeah, thank you so much, Allah. I know, I know you. This is a nice case that Allah just uh, uh, did uh, recently himself, and it was a nice, nice case, and it'd be interesting to hear what people's thoughts were. So, Allah, I'll, I'll play the slides for you. You just tell me what to say next, and I'll, I'll, I'll play them for you. Sure. So this is an interesting case, a mix of glaucoma and uh, tear segment. And uh, both Ike and I had a debate on it as well. So it would be nice to hear your opinion. So this is an 81-year-old uh, lady who is diabetic. She did have a history of lung cancer. She recovered from it, but still had breathing problems. Thus, uh, beta blockers were not an option for her glaucoma. She was diagnosed uh, originally with uh, pseudoexfoliation glaucoma, mild in the right eye and moderate in the left eye. The highest recorded pressure was 34, and she had FACO IOL in 2012 uh, in her left eye. Uh, she presented to us in June with elevated pressure and subluxated intraocular lens. Uh, next. And this was in the left eye? The in the left eye. Elevated yeah. pressure? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, the elevated pressure and the this, uh, subluxated lens. So when we saw her, the vision was counting finger. As I said, the pressure was 34 on latanoprost. So she was placed on bromonidine and acetazolamide, uh, 250 BID. And the visit afterwards, when we saw her, she was like 15 on uh, three classes. Uh, she had an infratemporal subluxation of the intraocular lens back complex with some fibrosis. We found it as a possible potential case for repositioning. She had open angles and uh, 0.7 concentric cupping. Next. So this is her UBM, which shows how the uh, lens is dislocated and from temporary from pseudoexfoliation. Uh, uh, next. And I wanted to show the 2018 uh, visual fields are the fields that are provided by her referring doctor. And you can see that at that time, the left eye had kind of a mild disease. Whereas in the 2021, obviously there is a lot of uh, media opacity from the lens uh, subluxation that might affect the uh, reliability of staging this disease. But you could argue that maybe she have advanced between uh, those two years. So uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So it's the same story as well. The, on the left, you have the 2018 RNFL uh, OCT, which didn't show much of uh, RNFL loss. Whereas the one we took recently because of the lens subluxation, there aren't any uh, picked up uh, images. I can go ahead. 
So uh, I would summarize my case as an 81-year-old patient with multiple uh, comorbidities. She had moderate pseudoexfoliation glaucoma based on the reliable testing. Currently, or uh, lately, she was controlled IP on three classes, including acetazolamide use, and had a subluxated eye well, and likely would go for a um, anterior segment procedure. Uh, next. Can you tell me how what? much, did she have any inflammation? And what did her gonio look like? No, so she didn't have any inflammation or cells at the time. Uh, and when I checked her gonio, she had like open angles, like grade four, uh, three plus PTM, I would say. A lot of pigment? Um, yes, like uniform pig pigment, yeah. Okay. So, so how you have, a reason, you have a reason you're asking that question? Yeah, so. There, oh, there she is, <laughs> making her cameo. So uh, there's a reason I asked that question. So you have to wonder, why is the pressure high? So if the angle is wide open and you have a sublux lens and you give this patient a pseudo exfoliation, you gotta think, okay, why is it high? So a couple of things, there's pigment that is, or there's, there's all that exfoliative material. It actually is on the zonules. So what I'm thinking is somehow once the zonules disrupted and, and basically lost their um, elasticity, all of that exfoliative material could have been exposed and it could actually just um, go into the angle and cause IOP spikes. You could see, you could sometimes see it, sometimes you can't see it. So that's my number one thing is there's something clogging up the angle. I would probably do angle surgery and I would probably fix that lens and suture it to the um, iris, which again, we know is going to fluff up more exfoliative material, but you know we gotta get some good pressure control. Um, so that's what I predict is the reason I don't think, or the other way it could be is some kind of UGG syndrome where the lens is chafing on the ciliary body or the back of the iris. And again, causing some kind of inflammation or pigment to kind of be released. But either way, I would um, suture up the lens. I would have Ike do that for sure. And then I would um, clean up the angle and do some kind of unroofing, either goniotomy of some sort, omni, any of the choices that are comfortable for people or, or GAT is fine too. Uh, great huh. summary, Sahar. Great, great summary. I think, I think, yeah, these patients who have dislocations often do have some chafing or pigment release, as you mentioned, or UGG syndrome. I think those are really, really great points. And I think often if you can just fix the lens even, alone even, that often is enough. Um, this patient has pseudoexfoliation, so you know certainly has some underlying TM dysfunction as well or, or outflow issues as well. And the challenge for us is, of course, it's been hard to determine the um, severity because the view is so challenging with the lens being subluxed as well. So, um, so we were debating this, and maybe let me put the poll up uh, I'll, right, so I'll launch the poll here for everybody. So, so what would you do in combination with a lens repositioning or exchange? So you're going to have to fix the lens; it's dropping, it's like shaking everywhere. But now you're thinking, what would you do in combination for it? Maybe I could have put do nothing else, just do a lens exchange or repositioning. But we see uh, different options: MIG, stenting, or trabeculotomy approaches, subconj, trabeculotomy, tube shunt. So, what was the pressure on MTMT? So on MTMT, yeah, it was like 15. 15 on 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 bromonidine and acetazolamide, right? Acetazolamide and uh, latanoprost. And latanoprost, OK. OK. You know, occasionally I, I will, if the patient can kind of afford it on their nerve, do a um, take them off the acetazolamide to see actually how high their pressure goes. Sometimes a lot of these patients will come in on all these medications and you don't know, maybe their pressure is not that bad. Uh, so I will trial that, you know, on way, on route to surgery, uh, just to kind of confirm if I should be doing something to lower the pressure or not. That's 100% accurate, you're right. Now she presented with a high pressure when she came in, yeah. uh, off medications at 35, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think to decide this, sometimes it helps you to, uh, you know, take them off some meds and see what they end up being, maybe a partial washout. So it's a good point. Okay, let me just uh, share the poll results here. Looks like the uh, the group here is voting for some sort of mixed procedure, uh, an abinternal trabeculotomy or a gap procedure, the majority, or stenting. There was a couple for subconj MIGs and TRABs, and then there was tube shunt. Very few people voted for tube shunt. So Allah, what, what happened here? 
I'll yeah. let you talk to the video. Talk to the video then. So, so uh, we have decided then because of the pressure in Dymox use that we might need to go for something more definitive. Especially it's COVID, we can't go twice for OR. So we went for a tube. You can see over here. I started off by placing the Ahmed valve plate. Then I go ahead and uh, do my IOL repositioning procedure. I'm forming the uh, AC over here and expecting inspecting where is my haptics. And luckily it's in a site where I can place the tube away from the scleral uh, fixating sutures. I'm doing my scleral groove over here. I'll be doing the needle passes uh, in a moment. Uh, it's uh, useful to use hooks as well to kind of visualize where the haptics are. Um, I'm doing the two passes. This is a speed up uh, video. And this is the second pass. So the first one was below the haptic. The second one was above and we tie the knot. Uh, you can speed Dr. Ahmed if you want to a little bit. Like, like in the OR, I'm pushing you to hurry yeah. up. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so obviously yeah, I'm doing the knot over here. I do the paretomy in the uh, other side, 180 degrees. Same thing, uh, pass the suture below the haptic. Then the second one would be above and we do the knot. Yeah, we can speed up this part, I guess. Yep. Yeah, we tied the knot and then I go back again. So you can see I've done my needle track uh, for the uh, tube insertion and I put the tube and I've used uh, the seal over here to place my patch graft and uh, secure it in place. And then I do my conjunctival closure. So I, I closed up the uh, uh, tube implant first, and then I went ahead and closed the another uh, the other uh, scleral parotomy. And that was the case, central lens with a tube. Um, this patient was recently operated. We don't have a lot of visits, but post-op day one, pressure of 11, form chamber. We took her off everything, and she's doing uh, pretty well so far. We'll be seeing her this week, hopefully. Well, that's fantastic. So what ultimately got you to choose a tube over there? <laughs> so uh, actually I was voting with doing eye stents. Uh, I was more uh, into the tube idea. And basically we were concerned about um, what if the eye stents were not enough? What if that patient was really more like into an advanced disease and we end up going, have to go back again to OR? I mean, with COVID, it's very difficult to get patients um, on multiple follow-ups and definitely ORs. That was one thought. The thought of doing GAT or trabeculotomy, I, I'm more concerned about the bleeding and view. As you can see with uh, anterior segment surgeries, um, visibility is one key factor. And if I had a trabeculotomy that is bleeding all the time, uh, I wouldn't be able to suture the lens that well. Yeah. So, so I think that was a key factor. Um, I'm still, till date, I would say debate that maybe an eye stent could have been uh, worth the shot based on the 2018 results, but who knows, so. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really big discussion we had. By the way, Annalisa, nice to see Annalisa here. She says she's using to seal for the entire conge, right? No, lot, no need to even switch to the conge, just put to seal and close the conge with it, and especially for the other strotomy, right, area where you had the uh, suture. So I think, yeah, you're right, Annalisa, uh, for sure. Um, to seal is nice when you already have it open. It's kind of handy to have that. Um, so yeah, it, this, this was a tough call. Um, we do a lot of IOL surgeries um, for sublux lenses and pseudo X. And I would say the majority that have elevated pressure, we do uh, eye stents, you know. Um, do a trabeculotomy, um, you know, when you do a vitrectomy, if you have to do it, uh, or a lot of manipulation enter segment, pressure drops, is variable, and you do get hyphemas intraoperative or post-op. There's a bit, bit higher chance of that. And you know, we just don't like to mess around with all those things happening. If it was just a straightforward case, I think a GAC could be done. Of course, we we, do, we certainly talked about that as well. Um, uh, you know, so the question was for us was whether we would do kind of stenting, which I think is less likely to cause IFEMA versus uh, a tube. And I think in this case, oh, someone someone wants you there, uh, Sahar. Someone's <laughs> looking for you. <laughs> you made a cameo. Nice. I like that. You made a cameo. That's right. <laughs> Although he was, I think he was about to come and uh, do something to you, but I think he turned around and went back out. <laughs> he was grabbing something. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, Tom, now he's, he's in the glaucoma world now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So uh, I won't ask. Who, uh, sorry, I don't want to ask who that is, though. I might. I don't want to, uh, you know, get you in trouble. 
<laughs> I won't tell you who that is. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, and so, and so, um, you know, in this case, I just had a feeling because a this patient, uh, you know, had a, had a presenting pressure of 35. They're on Diamox and a couple other drops, um, and the pressure's controlled still. But I just, I just had a feeling that we were going to be fighting with the pressure and the meds. Uh, almond valves, fortunately, generally speaking, are, are, are fairly fairly reasonable in terms of their post-op recoveries. And I don't like doing a trabeculectomy in these cases. I think a, a, a nice valve device, I think, is safe to do in this elderly population. So we went that way. Um, it's just, again, more anecdotal from our personal experience. We probably should analyze our data more, looking at combined procedures with IOL procedures and see how they do. Um, but that's kind of just been our own experience. You, you guys probably do so many of the IOLs and combined procedures that you have enough information, like for instance, knowing that you're gonna get these IOP fluctuations just within the case, that's gonna create this um, hypotony and then bleeding and then, you know, then you can't suture your lens or you can't see it well, all of these things all during this one case. So I think that's a really, really good point. And you can only learn that if you do a million of them, so good. Yeah, it's hard. yeah, exactly. I think you're right, Sahar. I mean, and we probably don't have, don't have the right answer. I mean, if she had the tube complication, we're going to be like regretting it possibly, you know, and we could have maybe just done nothing and just done the OL procedure and she would continue her Diamox. And although we don't like Diamox in an older patient, of course, we didn't have the luxury of waiting too much because, you know, her lens was, you know, was, was every week kind of dropping, you know, and so we didn't want to wait too long on that one. Otherwise, I love your idea of saying, let's stop the Diamox and see where she's at if she's bumps up to 30, you have your answer. Maybe if she stones up to 20, maybe you're okay. So um, those are all considerations. And the purpose of these discussions are kind of just to, to do that. But as all I know, we debated that. We even on the morning of, we were planning on on IOL. I sent, and I sent a message about 10 minutes before surgery. Actually, no, let's do a non-eval for that case. So we were we were, we were were going back and forth on this as well. So, But it's but it's very nice surgery. Uh, Allah, thanks for sharing that. Um, wow. And again, uh, always, always some controversies in, the, in these cases. So I wanted to just uh, maybe just wrap it up. Uh, it's been really great to see uh, all these cases, and, and Sophie's looking for me to to, to read soon. Um, I wanted to maybe just give everyone their last uh, words uh, about uh, you know selecting glaucoma procedures. Maybe I'll start with our fellows. You guys have been here for a year. I don't know if I don't know if if uh, if it's made it clearer or less clear about what to choose, what procedure for what patient. Uh, we're lucky we have all these options. We do use every option that's that's out there, but uh, there's still a lot more we have to learn. Maybe I'll start with you, Valentina. Any any just general pearls to share with the um, with the uh, with the, with our group here about you know understanding the procedure selection and what you go through when you think about that when you finish your fellowship and how you'll use that information. I think it has definitely helped us uh, see which patient is best for each procedure. And I mean, before doing this fellowship. I, I don't think we're going to have a big armament trial. Like I love having so many options, you know, and then what's best for the patient. So instead of just going like either glaucoma drops or SLT jumping. So a huge step to go into trap and tube. I love that we have this like middle stage and not just for the disease of the patient, but also how the patients don't want to have a major surgery. I think it's great that we have this on our toolbox. Thank you. Great. TC, you're, you're your thoughts? Yeah, so one thing that I think I've learned a lot is uh, when you're, uh, before you're doing, uh, you're deciding which surgery you're doing, don't think just about the IOP. So think about if the patient, is the patient uh, tolerating the medication well? Is the patient a steroid response? Because if the patient is tolerating the medication well, maybe it's better if you do a, a, a mixed procedure and you just leave in a few meds then um, then performing a subicon procedure. So this is, I think it's one point that I've learned a lot. Don't focus only on the target IOP, but also in the, like, the whole, um, and the, all the, the factors. Great, great thoughts. Uh, Just to say one more thing, like I love the analogy that we, we keep telling our patients, you know, like the invasive surgery is like, open heart surgery versus like closed heart surgery with the stent side. I, I just love that analogy and I, truly believe that that's the right in, in the glaucoma it's the same you know some patients are not ready for the open heart surgery and it's good that we have the option of doing and saying that it's not open heart yeah it's a good analogy i think you know uh you know uh you know angioplasty or stenting versus uh, bypass and and kind of correlating it to level of disease if your disease is so bad we're not going to even do angioplasty we're going to go right to bypass 
um, versus somebody maybe where we can start with this and then think of something later on. I think the stepwise approach is, I think, really good. Uh, I think as you heard, as you heard today from others, I mean, trying to trying to figure out is the resistance where's the resistance point? I think Paul mentioned this as well. Like, is it is it at the TM primarily? Is it beyond the TM? Can you have any guidance on this based on age, underlying diagnosis, chronicity of disease? Um, you know, perhaps response to SLT or pilocarpine. Uh, you know, maybe some imaging in the future. You know, that's those are the kind of things that I think can guide us one way or the other because we have some big wins with with uh, mixed procedures, like big wins, and it's like wow. We avoid a bleb in that patient. Then we have other MIGs where we do where it's like, you know what? It didn't do much, you know, and it's like we just wasted time or wasted or wasted resources to do that, to do that. And I think we really have a long way to go to kind of help with procedure selection and matching the patients, as you can see. But one thing I do know is that a long-term bleb, no matter what which way you make a bleb, is always going to be at risk for infection. And we do see this, unfortunately, long-term with some of our patients. I think mitomycin reduces that. And I think I do think subconscious MIGs like Zen and Preserve Flow, I think create better blebs, but we still have some ways to go on that. Allah, let me get your chance to go your two cents about any pearls you can add for the next uh, generation. So, so I think the uh, uh, selection of the best glaucoma procedure to perform for a patient is multifactorial. It depends on what you have accessible in your hospital, uh, what you're comfortable with and uh, target pressures and patient staging as well. But I think the number one uh, thing to have in mind is what is the patient's uh, glaucoma staging? And this is what is important. Even though if we like to do a mixed procedure or we like to do a specific device, I think we should do what is best for the patient and what is suitable for them. Uh, I would say this is the number one reason. Uh, second thing I would say, um, I was quite impressed like through my fellowship is uh, seeing how trabecular uh, meshwork uh, MIGs have been really like life-saving in a lot of cases where we just use them and they just do the job. We don't know, we don't need to go for an invasive uh, procedure. And the third point is to learn how to adapt to change your plan. COVID was a big lesson to me in how we shifted our like strategy and uh, planning for surgery. I would say this year we've switched our practice to doing. Um, Tubes, I guess, during COVID. Maybe uh, I can. I have done a lot of tubes during COVID, so uh, I, I think that changed the algorithm uh, algorithm as well. Yeah, so certainly. COVID does, make yeah. Us, does make it does make us pause and change change tact. You're absolutely right. Sahar, I want to give you uh, the last word. Um, well, I think some pearls, you know, I, I said this earlier and I, I always say it, I say it to my patients too, is that each patient encounter is very unique. Um, I, I, look, I take into consideration as patients' lifestyle, whether they can put the drops in, whether their age, whether they can come back for a second or third or fourth procedure. And if they can't, then I cut to the chase and, and be aggressive. Or, you know, um, if they're at risk for hypotony or if they have a complication, you have to kind of create this little mosaic for each patient. It is um, somewhat time consuming. You have to have a lot of discussion with the patient. I do anyways. I try to kind of inform them and let them help me make the, that decision as well. Um, but I already, when I plan surgery number one, I'm, I'm also planning surgery number two, three, and four in my mind. And that way it allows me to kind of navigate each surgical case. So, and the other pearl really is to um, expand your skills and learn things and do them multiple times. Because if you're stuck and you only know how to do a tube, then your answer is always gonna be a tube, you know? So just go out there, do five, 10, 15 cases of something, even if it's not great the first five. Um, and that way you learn what you can do because there will always be one patient that's going to need that one thing that you did that one time 10 years ago <laughs> um and i think that's valuable yeah i mean what, what a great what a great way to close this in terms of what your training is and what you learn and i think you know we got to have uh different outflow um procedures in our back pocket and although we don't know exactly what fits for what all the time i think having the ability to offer it and to individualize and learn from it i think is what's important and i hope these cases have brought it out that you know we, we can't get out of traps, we can't get out of tubes, we can't get out of MIGs. We've all got some roles uh, in, in these procedures. And I think they're all gonna be ways that we can you know further refine what we do. So uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's work on this. Valentina, uh, TC, Allah, thank you for preparing these cases. 
Um, and of course, we want to thank uh, Arsham and Paul. We really didn't need them. We gave them a bit of airtime <laughs> earlier on. They're, they're, you know, Sahar was uh, all we needed here. Uh, Sahar, thank you so much. You're, you're always uh, so willing to participate and teach, uh, despite your busy career and your busy uh, life at home and family. As you can see, you're, you've got people coming out of your room. <laughs> when, when you, uh, my door, like, the kids are ready for you. <laughs> yes, I'm sure they are. So I do want to let you go. Irfan, I want to thank Irfan here who's in the background, who's we'll be hearing more from in the future as well. And I want to thank Matt for adding his input as well. I do want to, again, remind everybody uh, that for our next uh, couple of sessions, uh, we are going to be uh, doing our rounds on uh, Saturday uh, morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, Toronto time. I know it's a bit early for those on the West Coast. I apologize. We will move things around as we uh, get feedback from people about what the best time is for them. Hopefully, uh, those of you that are it's early in the morning, you can wake up in the morning, get a cup of coffee and participate in our rounds. And those of you that are uh, in Europe and around the world, uh, it might be a bit of an easier time for you to attend. So. Uh, we will continue to work on on timing and and try to find the best uh, way to to do these events. I always I always enjoy hearing these and learn from these as well. And so I hope you did as well. And thank you all from around the world who joined us. Uh, stay well, stay healthy, uh, and we'll see uh, you on Saturday morning this week. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.